Thank you very much. And let me go ahead and introduce the panel here, and then we'll get started. So to my immediate left is uh, Wheaton Little, who's Director of Operations and Strategy, Worldwide Business Development, uh, Asia for GSK, uh, where he coordinates and sources business development opportunities uh, for GSK R&D from the Asia Pacific region. Um, also, uh, and, and what I thought was particularly interesting, uh, is he manages the Academic Center of Excellence in Singapore, uh, which focuses on transitioning early drug development efforts in academia uh, to co-development with GSK. Um, he has a PhD in molecular biology uh, from uh, uh, University of Cambridge. And to his left is Jean-Jacques bien uh from Biomarin Pharmaceutical. Um, he, he is um, uh, since 2005, a chief executive officer and member of the board of directors of Biomarin with more than 25 years of pharma experience before that in a variety of companies. Um, under his leadership, uh, Biomarin has significantly increased its um, market valuation uh, and, um, uh, and grown in size. Before, uh, before Biomarin, he was uh, in leadership roles in um, Genencore, Sangstat, uh, before that, Genzyme, Ronpalagror, and a very long CV, so I won't read all of it, but very uh, uh, prestigious uh, background in, um, in biopharma. And to his left is Ravi Soda. Ravi um, uh, got his PhD and MBA uh, in the UK in pharmacology, uh, PhD. Uh, spent several years in research, followed by clinical development uh, at uh, then Smith Klein Beecham, uh, sale, sales and marketing at Novartis, uh, then business development licensing at Novartis. Uh, and he's currently um, uh, senior director of business development with Actilian Pharma out of Switzerland. So, welcome to the panel. So what, what we thought we would do um, is we would ask each of the panel members to speak for a few minutes, um, then turn to questions both from the audience and, and I have a few things that might stimulate some discussion. So please be thinking of what you'd might like, you might like to ask as well. Okay, why don't we ask you to go ahead. Would you like to go first? Sure. Hello? Yeah, so let's see. Um, I think you know, when, when looking at the title of the, of the panel, Preparing business development strategies in Asia. Uh, the, thing, the first thing that, that comes to my mind is really thinking through um, each country within Asia and, and how they fare in terms of an integrated drug, drug discovery and development uh, infrastructure. And so, you know, I, in, in the course of, of, of my, my workday, um, I, I see Korea, I see Singapore. Um, I go to Japan, we've got China and Taiwan, and each of these different countries have very, very different, um, uh, uh, very different sort of infrastructural advantages and disadvantages. And so when, when, when considering um, business development strategies in Asia, really, you know, we can look at the strengths of each region as being an opportunity. Um, we can also look at the weakness of each region as being an opportunity. So, um, you know, if we consider academic uh, strengths within the within the different regions. Um, Korea and Japan have have very very strong um, academic uh, institutes, um, but uh, the early stage venture funding that you see in those countries um, is is somewhat lacking. And so you know, and, and it's it's different when you look at Korea. Um, you have a lot of resources going into biosimilars in. Uh, in you know, it's the large conglomerates and biotechs, um, which sort of removes the early stage venture funding from the academic um, institutes. And so, despite having very strong technology transfer, um, what you have is you don't have sort of the the influx of technologies into early stage biotechs. And I think you know that's that's a that's an opportunity and that's a strategy that that someone could go into Korea with. Um, equally well, the strength of Korea. Uh, you know, really is around sort of this, this large burgeoning of biosimilars um, that you see with the conglomerates, that you see with the, with the biotech companies. Um, uh, I think when you look at uh, technology transfer in China, it's historically much sort of weaker um, than you see in, in Korea, than you see in Japan, than you see in Singapore. Um, and so, you know, uh, there is uh, with SIBs, there's sort of an increase in the sophistication around technology transfer, but 
you know, we found it actually somewhat difficult in engaging the, the very, very good um, universities in China that have excellent science, um, but the technology transfer offices are a little bit weak. Um, and so getting the technology out of the universities and into either biotech or into large pharma uh, remains a challenge. Um, on the other hand, China has, uh, you know, is flush with cash, with 300 billion U.S. dollars being committed on the provincial and governmental level um, to the development of biotech infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, you have a challenge, which I think you can view as an opportunity. On the other hand, you have, you know, a, a real sort of resource that you can leverage um, potentially to, to make use of that challenge. I realize that I'm, I'm sort of using up a lot of time, so I, I can come back to Singapore um, and Japan later. Thanks very much. And Jean-Jacques, would you like to make some comments? Uh, yes, thank you. So we are somewhat smaller than GlaxoSmithKline, so, uh, um, but we're going to get there. <laughs> so the company is only 15 years old. Um, it's uh, relatively small in size, com in size compared to most big pharma companies, but uh, we have about 1,100 employees now around the world, and we're going to generate about $500 million of revenues uh, this year. Most of it outside Asia Pacific, although Asia Pacific is growing very fast from a smaller base. Actually, the head of Asia Pacific, Cynthia Lu, is in the room and attending the meeting. Um, so, talking about partnering, actually, we only have four products on the market, and our third product, which uh, we are sitting in the US, actually came from Japan, from Asia Pacific. Um, so, we acquired um, an, a preclinical package basically from Daiichi. And Daiichi was selling this product in Japan for an ultra-rare ultra disorder called uh, BH4 deficiency, which is a lethal disease, but effective about only 15, 20 patients in Japan. <clears throat> they charge about a million dollars per year uh, for these patients. Um, so, so the issue we are facing is that um, <clears throat> our products are uh, relatively expensive because they're also expensive to manufacture. They address very small orphan or ultra-orphan patient populations, so we have to charge a significant amount of money to be able to um, recoup our investments and, and cover the manufacturing cost. Um, so I can go back you know, as to the different partnerships we have around Asia Pacific. We have a direct presence in Hong Kong. Um, and our plan is actually to build down the road a direct presence in Japan. So we are partnering with Daiichi and with a small biotech company called Angus in Japan. So we have two partners there. <clears throat> but since we have five molecules, new molecules in the clinic, we I think we have enough to potentially have critical mass to start our own business in Japan. And, um, and regarding China, we can go back. Again, our products are so expensive that, you know, uh, it's difficult to address the Indian market and the Chinese market. We have a few patients in Hong Kong, but we don't really have a patient yet in mainland China. Although I understand things are changing, and specifically in Shanghai, uh, there is now a coalition between patient groups, uh, private insurance, the city of Shanghai government, and, uh, and other uh, partners to potentially cover the cost and reimburse the cost of ultra orphan drugs. One last point uh, in terms of introduction. We actually have, in terms of insourcing, we actually have, and I, th I said that this morning, uh, we have about 12 people that work uh, in, uh, in discovery research and medicinal chemistry in Shanghai. Uh, we did not really recruit them there, but we acquired a company, a small company in California called uh, Lee Therapeutics that has a cancer, a highly targeted cancer product in development, a PARP inhibitor. And with it came actually around 12 PhDs um, that work in Shanghai doing medicinal chemistry and, and lead optimization. And they're doing a great job. But the issue is always that <clears throat> even if uh, we end up developing some of the molecules they generate, they will be kind of American molecules. And it goes back to the discussion we had this morning is that we still haven't seen any new chemical entity coming out of <clears throat> Asia Pacific outside of Japan for different reasons which we can discuss, but I think eventually it will happen but, uh, <clears throat> because there is a lot of money being poured into the field, but, but there is no Asian company outside of Japan today that is able to develop a molecule on a global basis. Thanks very much, Ravi. Um, good afternoon. Um, so uh, like Biomarine, Actelion is also considerably smaller than GSK um, and j, &J where we aspire to be um, those big companies one day. Um, so we are, we are a, a fully integrated R&D based uh, company out of uh, Switzerland. Uh, we have uh, 
sales of just under $2 billion and a market cap of about $5 million, depending on the time of the day or the week. Um, we have 2,500 people uh, workforce, of which 1,000 is devoted to uh, drug discovery and uh, um, uh, a clinical development. We have four products on the market, and we sell in 66 countries, and out of those 66 countries, we have 33 uh, um, commercial affiliates where we sell ourselves, uh, and that includes um, USA, Canada, all of Europe, uh, uh, Brazil, Mexico, uh, and in the Asia side, we are present with our own sales force in uh, China, Korea, Taiwan, which was opened just a few days ago, uh, and Japan, and uh, Australia. Um, all our drug discovery is out of uh, um, Switzerland. We do not have uh, drug discovery outside, but of course we run clinical trials um, tr or, or everywhere. And including the, in the Asian countries, we are also present, uh, one should not forget Singapore, we are present here. And, and I know that in, in, the, in the audience uh, we have Sh uh, Sh uh, Cheryl Tan, who is uh, managing our Singapore office, and in case anyone wants any further questions for the region. In terms of um, partnering, um, I, in, these in these countries, especially if I limit to India, Korea, Taiwan, and China, one size does not fit all. I think one needs to have a, a specific partnership for each of the countries. There is no, there is no one type of agreement that fits all. But maybe as, as we move into the discussion, maybe other things will come out and, and we can discuss more. Thank you very much. Let me ask, are there any questions from the audience? Don't be shy. Well, you, ah, <laughs> sure. I'll take the uh, chairman's uh, prerogative of asking the first. Wheaton, I was uh, intrigued by your comment about the TTOs being something of a weakness. I, I would posit that that's not necessarily a, a regional uh, facet. It's probably more uh, seen more broadly than you think. But how, how is it, or how do you, as a, as a big farmer, try and interact and guide the TTOs and the BDMs and even the scientists to to what you see as GSK's ends so that you can actually create a partnership of some value? Um, so I have to say that sitting in this morning in the audience, I didn't believe that it was hard to hear the questions, but I now believe that it's very hard to hear the questions. Um, so I'm, if, yeah, if some... Maybe, can, maybe you need to turn one of the, one of the speakers around. <laughs> Let me repeat the question. Uh, I mean, maybe you can't even hear from there. No, that's good. Uh, so, uh, TTOs being a, a weak point, yeah. uh, I think it's, uh, it's more common than just in, uh, particularly in China, because yeah. I see it quite uh, even in the first world. But how do you, as a big farmer, try and guide or uh, lead the uh, BDMs and the, and the TTOs and even the scientists to an end where you see some value in the relationship? Yeah, so, so I think in terms of um, pharma leading TTOs to become more effective. It's 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 really um, it, I think it's really in terms of making the governments aware that the policies that they may have or the provisions that they may have around inventorship um, uh, may create problems for the TTOs. And I think I think that's I think that's the the case in China where really what we need. Um, you, you know, I, I would say the most successful TTO in China is Gordon Zong's group, which is a private TTO on behalf of the, the, the Shanghai Institute of Biological Sciences. And what he's done is to privatize this, and in doing that, he's able to recruit the sorts of PhDs and legal, you know, people in the legal profession to really um, go after uh, prosecuting patents that are not too broad, you know, that are not sort of too broad, but not detailed enough, and not too detailed, but not broad enough, really getting that middle ground. Um, I think, you know, so in China, it may be that he's sort of the leader of fixing the, the, the TTO problem in China. Um, I think looking at, you know, looking at, at Japan, you have very active TTOs. I don't think there's really any problem in Japan. Um, in, uh, in Korea and Taiwan, I think it's the same except for a slightly different reason. The Korean government has really taken a very active stance 
in, um, in having uh, a sort of governmental TTO on behalf of every, every Korean university. Um, and it's sort of in the form of a patent office. So you have uh, you know, lawyers who are helping, you know, who, 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 you know, IP lawyers who are helping administer um, tech transfer and really recruiting conversations between industry and, and academics. Um, in terms of, for Singapore, for Singapore, you know, there's, there's many different um, institutes, and so each one has, has their own tech transfer office, and each one of them has, I think, its own challenges and its own strengths. Um, uh, you know, within, um, so, and, and I talk, you know, I talk to all the tech transfers uh, offices uh, regularly in Singapore. So, I mean, I think I've been, in general, uh, very happy with tech transfer everywhere outside of China. Um, and I think Gordon Zong is probably the way that it's going to clean itself up. So l let me ask a question, then we'll come back to the audience again. Um, so the government of Japan, which is near and dear to my heart because it's where I live, um, has taken the perspective that there's a lot of innovation in Japan, which is true, um, but there aren't very many deals because pharmaceutical companies can't find the innovation, and they see that as the key hurdle to partnerships or deals in Japan. Let me ask uh, maybe uh, three of you, or maybe Ravi, you want to comment first. Um, do you think that's really the, the hurdle, or what are, what are the gaps in terms of being able to do better business development in Asia, and it doesn't have to be, we don't see it as one country, but multiple countries? I, I think that the, 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 the first problem that we face is, is actually locating an opportunity. It's really finding it. Uh, it's a huge marketplace, and, and uh, if you look at the terrain of the, the size of the, the number of companies and the actual uh, square kilometers or square miles is enormous. And, and so to find an opportunity is not easy. Once you find an opportunity, the valuation of the asset is not easy. And, and this, is, this is not necessarily true only for Asian uh, companies, um, but it's, it's particularly true for some of the companies where um, you know, you, you find that what um, has been done in research is not what needs to be done. And, uh, you know, what has been done is, is really not what you would expect to find in terms of results. And yet the valuation is extremely high. So that's, that's the first hurdle. The second hurdle actually is an internal hurdle because, you know, once you find an asset and you put a valuation to it, you really have a big internal hurdle in your own company um, where you really need to overcome uh, the opposition to say that this is really, um, although it may be uh, discovered uh, 10,000 kilometers away, it is really um, an asset. That th these two hurdles are, are really enormous hurdles. Sounds like for Wheaton, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> slightly different, different perspective. Um, Going back to the molecule we in license from Daiichi, actually we didn't pay that much for it. Uh, and I think, but it goes back to what was said earlier, is that even, even some Japanese company uh, in the past is changing, but they do develop molecules mainly with the internal Japanese market in mind. So they don't really, from the get-go, they don't structure a global development plan that will take this molecule globally. So actually we were very lucky with this product BH4, which is a trade named Kuvana for a disease called uh, fatal ketonuria or PKU that affects about 50,000 patients in the world. It's actually, it's not a life-threatening disease, but it's a pretty serious disease in the sense that uh, it can lead to mental retardation. Actually, before the mid-60s, before uh, newborn screening was uh, becoming systematic in the developed world, uh, it was the number one cause of mental retardation in the world. So what happened is that Daiichi had this molecule, as I said, they developed it in Japan for ultra, ultra rare indication of BH4 deficiency, and they hadn't done any real work to develop the product for PKU. So we picked it up. We only pay, I think, around $15 million up front to acquire the preclinical package. Then we developed the drug. We did all the clinical work for global launch in PKU, which is a much, much larger market. And actually, we re, out, re, we re licensed the product back to Daiichi for them to be able to promote it for PKU in Japan. So it's kind of an interesting case study that, that illustrates, you know, what Ravi said, that many of them don't, you know, think about the global, uh, the global market. Great case study. <laughs> Didn't you want to comment? Yeah, so I think, I think there's some truth to it, actually. I, um, I, don't, I don't know if, if their approach to the solution is 
um, and maybe you can talk about that afterwards, is, is the solution that I would propose. But in looking at the Asia region, the, the, the place where I think that there are hidden gems of small biotechs that I haven't seen yet in the past sort of year and a half would be Japan. Um, and you know, we're seeing, we're seeing innovative, I, I think we're seeing very innovative um, uh, sort of, you know, biologics, you know, biologic, early stage biologic discovery um, in small, small biotechs in Japan. Um, I do think that some of the small molecule uh, discovery programs in Japan um, are maybe not as innovative, but in terms of antibody therapies, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to find, you know, two that I'd never heard of that have, you know, interesting, um, interesting uh, therapeutics to novel targets. Thanks. Well, wait, just a, a side comment, what we talked about earlier as we were preparing for the session was, the solution of the government in Japan was they felt that the real problem was that small biotechs weren't capable of doing phase one studies, so their solution was to perhaps build a phase one center for biotechs to bring their compounds through phase one. I actually think that's probably not, that's my own uh, editorial comment, I don't think that's the problem. Pharma companies do phase one really well. The issue is making the connections and having the right package that the pharma companies get interested because uh, biotechs don't need to learn how to do phase one. Yeah, and just to reiterate that point, I mean, you know, in seeing a lot of phase one assets, a lot of times our, our clinical and discovery development units will say, well, you know, it's interesting, you know, um, the, 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 the valuation that you're going to give it after a phase one is going to be mismatched with what we would give it, so let's wait until after phase two. And so, you know, I think that points, I mean, I think that points really to sort of, GS, you know, GSK is interested in engaging around phase two assets where a lot of the risk has been decharged and, and there can be kind of um, a meeting of the minds on what the asset valuation is, or, you know, really on sort of a complete preclinical package or a discovery program um, around novel targets. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? This is your opportunity to be thought-provoking and stimulating. It's, I thought it was postprandial lethargy then, probably. Hi, this is Vinay Krishna from j and as well. Uh, question to Ravi, but anyone can on the panel can answer this. Uh, about it's, it's question is about scouting. You said, I mean, you're a sm smaller a company than the big farmers, and uh, I think you can't hear the question. <laughs> come, come closer. And ask, yeah. the, ask the question, because they'll hear through the microphone, and we'll hear you speaking directly. Yeah. So the question really is, uh, when you're a smaller size company, how do you? I mean, you don't have the fleets of scouts going around looking for these opportunities. How do you actually keep your eyes open? And, that, that's uh, a good question, and I have a very short and a quick answer. It's because we are small, we are not into we are, we are not into many therapeutic areas. You know, we cannot be. We need to be focused. So we have only one or two therapeutic areas in which we are really focused, and that's the that's the scouting we do. So it's easier than if you were GSK or J and J uh, or some other uh, big pharma which has uh, you know eight or ten therapeutic areas and a few um, other uh, nice to have therapeutic areas. That's that's how we do it. But we are, in terms of business development, we are a very small group. We are only um, uh, five of us in the group, and 40% uh, um, is actually based in this room right now. So, <laughs> so I'm sorry, any comments on that, of scouting for a smaller company? Yeah, again, we, <clears throat> we even have more limited resources than, than Actillion, so we haven't really done much of that. We're starting to uh, build up a, a business development team in um, California that is going to start you know, reaching out uh, towards the Pacific to in license and, and source molecule, um, but we don't have that much experience um, uh, doing that yet. Thank you. There was another question. Katie Jaspar from Novozymes uh, Biopharma, Denmark. Um, can, can, how can, we, you, can we yeah. invite you to come closer? <laughs> Sorry, but the acoustics really don't work unless <laughs> yeah, you come no close. So for a small biotech, um, what is that uh, this biotech need to do in terms of uh, building a, the good package for their technology to get uh, big pharma interested? So what does a good what is that you want to see? <laughs> so what does a good package look like from a biotech for big pharma? Yeah. They are the big, big pharma, pharma guys. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, for, for GSK, we really have an emphasis on, on novel mechanisms and transformative therapies. Um, so, 
and, and within that, you know, each, each of our discovery units has, has a, a strategy that they'll be carrying forward in the, in the next three to five years. Um, I know this is a very vague answer because really the answer is you need, to, you, need to, you, know, you need to talk with us about what the package is, what the mechanism is. A lot of times we're unable to engage simply because we're not, it's not core to our mechanistic approach for various therapies. Um, but you know, obviously strong, uh, strong preclinical package includes sort of you know, two animal talk studies and PKPD. Um, uh, you know, I, I can, we, you know, I, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to hook you up with, with people that you can talk to about that. But I think generally, you know, the, the first cut is really about is the mechanism something that, that, you know, that we can engage in. Um, because honestly, if the mechanism is something that we're excited about, we have, um, we have a, a section of our platform technology sciences unit that, you know, is very, um, is very able to help uh, partners in developing the appropriate preclinical package. I mean, yeah, to say we're not big pharma, but I would say, uh, <clears throat> and corroborate what was just said, like, what we are interested, I mean, first of all, if you want Biomarine to be interested in your product, it has to be an orphan indication. And it has to be either potentially first in class, that would be the first uh, new molecular entity that would be approved for that specific indication, or, or have a preclinical package that very, very, substantially positions that product as having a very, very good chance to be best in class. So if you look at the product, the four products we have on the market today, they are the only drugs approved for the education they treat. The products we have in development, two of them are for indications where there is no approved therapy today. Two of them have, you know, clear mechanism of action that uh, ensures that they have a very, very good chance to be best in class. So. We, we go after very difficult problems, like, you know, one of our next products in development is a CNP analog for achondroplasia, which is the number one cause of human dwarfism in the world. We're going after eradicating dwarfism in the world. That's a big goal. But that's the kind of stuff we're going after. So if you have something exciting like that, you can come and talk to Baumrein. Right? Very similar. Uh, I, don't, I, don't think that, uh, I don't think that we would look at uh, um, uh, a metoo type molecule, and, and we would look at a very substantial uh, um, tox uh, package as well. Thank you. One more question over here. Do we have a microphone? Okay, we'll give you a microphone. Very quickly, can I get a panel's perspective? Oh, sorry, <laughs> frighten you. Can I get a panel's perspective on uh, global deals versus regional or local deals? Going forward, what is the operating model that we're most likely to see? Question, uh, perspective on global deals versus regional or local deals. Anybody want to comment? Well, I, I can say very quickly, uh, and um, um, you, you, being a specialty farmer, we cannot have more than a, a small number of products. And it is very likely that in some of our regions or affiliates, um, one product is simply not enough. You know, you need you need uh, uh, um, uh, some sort of uh, um, um, uh, safety number. So you need to have in your uh, box maybe two products. So some of, sometimes a regional deal becomes more important or or uh, um, uh, uh, necessary to fill the the sales reps that's only selling one drug. And if you, can, if you can add another drug in the same indication or similar indication or in the same um, um, prescription calling uh, uh, um, area, then so much the better. So th that's why we have a regional versus uh, global. Global deals are, of course, always much nicer to have. Wait, do you want to come in? Yeah, so for, I would say, um, within the commercial organization, so for licensing of, of products uh, made by a different company that, that are already on the market, uh, that happens all the time um, regionally uh, within, you know, within Europe, GSK Europe, GSK, you know, your, uh, US Pharma, um, uh, emerging markets, Asia Pacific, Japan. It, it happens all the time. I would say in terms of sort of development deals, we haven't seen it happen yet. But certainly, we've talked about it, um, and and I think you know I think we're in a unique position now, 
the world is in a unique position now because China really is becoming a much more accessible market. And so I do think that you know, even if GSK isn't the first to sort of have a China-only deal um, with, with regards to a, a co-development, um, you, know, you will see someone do it soon. I, I will say, just to add a comment, um, different companies with, with which I've had experience have very different perspectives about this. So some companies, I think, look for very broad global deals. Um, other companies are pretty good at finding uh, regional deals, niche deals. Uh, so, so I think you know, probably a difference in company perspective and how, how well you can manage those kind of deals, too. Okay, so our time is finished. So we turn this, yep. Okay, we'll turn it back over. Thanks to the panel.